behind the net. Centers. Flat. Tries to Clark. John. Oh! Rebound! Score! Everybody, it's Isaiah. Just reminding you that FlyersNittyGritty.com and the OMB podcast are brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. Hey, do you have damage to your home? Not sure who to call? We suggest that you call Summit Public Adjusters before your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be very stressful. Let Summit take the stress out of the claims process. From storm damage to your roof, to toilet overflows, to broken pipes and fires, Summit gets you the most money for your repairs. So next time Mother Nature leaves you in need of repairs, call Summit Public Adjusters at 215-752-0560 or visit summitpublicadjusters.com. Again, Summit Public Adjusters. You can reach them at 215-752-0560 or just visit Summit with one T, publicadjusters.com, licensed in PA and New Jersey. And we are back. It is Isaiah, and we're here with another OMB podcast special. And tonight's guest is... uh, Amy Johnson from Rocket Sports Media. You also know her from the Flyers Report, the AHL Report. Amy, welcome back. I I can't thank you enough for having me. It's always good to talk to you and uh, happy to be here today. So thanks for having me. Ah, Great. Hey, hey, listen, obviously the uh, elephant in the room right now in the world of the National Hockey League is the the Stanley Cup final. And of course, the Montreal Canadiens, a team that you cover along with the Laval Rocket for Rocket sports uh, uh, media are are in the final. Now, we had game one last night, but that doesn't always tell the tale. It's just getting before that point, you know, the post-game reactions and things like that. Going into this final, what impression strikes you the most when assessing, you know, how the Canadians got here? And does it is it something that surprised you or did it confirm something that you believe during the season well that's a it's a great question and uh, one i think that every um media outlet journalist and fan in montreal uh is is certainly contemplating these days i would say for me the theme this postseason for the montreal canadians has been expect the unexpected um I, to answer your question it's a complete surprise to me i frankly uh expected toronto to make uh, quick work of them um and it looked to be going that way, of course, uh, once once the Canadians were down 3-1 in that first series. Um, and every time I, I've, I've given up trying to figure out if they're going to even win a game, much less a series, because uh, every time they, they look like they shouldn't uh, win a game, they manage to pull something miraculous out and, and get a victory. Every time they go against uh, a new opponent in a series that... There's plenty of reasons stacked against them of why they shouldn't win the series. They've managed to find a way to do just the opposite. So um, it has been quite a surprising run. Uh, I think they're enjoying being the perennial underdog for round after round after round in, in this playoff run. Uh, and now it's now it's down to their to their true test for sure. You know, we saw in the uh, semifinals, which of course in any other year would have been the conference finals uh, against Vegas. Um, that series started very similar to how this one did in that they did not look like they were going to be able to match up against the Golden Knights uh, after a pretty 
a pretty defining game one loss. And so we saw that happen again last night with Tampa Bay. Uh, the question now is going to be, are they going to be able to recreate what they did against Vegas and make the adjustments that they need to before game two? Uh, because if you remember against the Golden Knights, they came back in, in Vegas's building in T-Mobile Arena in game two, and they took that game. Uh, will they be able to do that in Tampa Bay? I think it's going to be a tougher challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, Tampa adds a lot of elements that other teams don't have, kind of like sure. the uh, the high end skill, along with the, um, I guess, battling for every inch of the ice and grinding you like the mm-hmm. Islanders, just kind of like a different version of that. Uh, for sure, you know, and it's it's. It's interesting, you know, there's before before this series, uh, you know, while everyone was watching uh, game seven between Tampa and the Islanders on on Friday, it was kind of, well, which would be the better matchup for Montreal? And and there were really big pros and cons for for each of them. Um, New York does uh, the Islanders do some of the similar things that the Canadians do. So would that be easier because it's an easier system for Montreal to figure out because they do a lot of the same things or, uh, you know, would Tampa be, be, I wouldn't say easier, but would they be a better suited matchup because of, uh, you know, the, the four check and the, and the strong defense that surprisingly the Canadians have managed to pull out of the bag in this postseason. Um, I think that will always be the who knows question. Uh, right now it's looking, you know, Tampa Tampa controlled that game last night uh, from, from top to bottom. They've got a very, very strong core of forwards, um, four lines that are lethal. Um, their power play is, you know, the Canadians have had a very good PK in, in this postseason, but they have not faced a power play like the Tampa Bay lightning. Um, and, and you saw, you saw John Cooper, even, even, okay, we have a brief five on three there in the third period. I'm going to go with five forwards. And um, while they didn't score on the five on three, they quickly scored on the, the subsequent power play. Once one of those penalties expired, um, it's it's a tall task against this Tampa Bay Lightning team for sure. Yeah, yeah, they uh, kind of sending a little bit of a message. More to come, right? More to come for sure. Um, you know, it's if there's one thing that's certain, uh, this Canadians team does not have quit in it. Uh, the guys in that locker room are are uh, very determined, particularly their leadership core. Um, the one thing that they have going for them is they have Carey Price. Uh, backstopping them in the crease, um, and Carey Price is looking every bit like the Carey Price who uh, won the Vesna and and has uh, always been able to turn it on in in big moments like this, and and he's doing just that. So, if they're going to have a chance, it's because Carey Price is going to uh, to make it possible for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and that kind of dovetails into the next question I had for you because when you look at what Mark Bergeron did in the off season. It seemed like he was particularly catering to a postseason run mm-hmm. rather than worrying about how high they were in the standings by bringing in uh, players that had pedigree, whether it was scoring and cup pedigree like Tyler Toffoli, cup pedigree and grit like uh, Corey Purry, and then you had Josh Anderson. And they, they really wanted to take what they did in the bubble last year and take it to another level. And yet, you know, in the regular season, they really they really struggled. I think what they lo- they lost their last five straight. Oh, that they they ended the regular season horribly. Um, it the the last few weeks of the season were abysmal, um, and quite frankly, um, you know, if 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 you looked at them objectively, didn't really deserve. Uh, to to make it to the postseason, they 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 limped pretty hard into the, into the playoffs, and you're right. Um, you know, Mark Bergevin made moves that were not um, looking at long term building. It was uh, needing experience and and Stanley Cup experience, playoff experience, uh, veteran experience. Eric Stahl's another addition, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there at the trade deadline. And Eric Stahl, quite frankly, did pretty much nothing in the regular season after that trade was made. And it was kind of looking like, oh, gosh, like, has Eric Stahl, is Eric Stahl done? 
he's turned on another level in the postseason. That's for sure. Um, and guys, you know, Corey Perry is obviously making a difference. Tyler Toffoli has been a a, a big move. Um, one of probably one of the best moves that Bergevin made this season was was bringing in Tyler Toffoli. Toffoli seems to have um, just found a whole a whole next level to his game uh, playing with Montreal and, and in the and in the postseason. Josh Anderson has has done well. Um, there were a couple of moves I think that didn't work to Bergevin's favor, uh, namely the trades for John Merrill and Eric Gustafson. Um, Flyers fans certainly know what a disappointment Gus was on the back end in Philadelphia. Uh, and that has certainly continued, uh, for, for, for his playing performance in Montreal. Um, most nights, even, even in these last couple of playoff games, he's getting less than three minutes of even strength playing time, which is negligible. Um, and, and pretty much, a you know, those turnovers that we saw plenty of times on uh, the Wells Fargo Center ice, there's still uh, a plenty for sure. Um, so that's a bit of a concern. My big thing is that um, in a in a typical season, all of these moves that Mark Bergevin made, while they were, they're now paying off because, as you say, they were they were moves that helped build a strong core for a postseason and a deep playoff run. Um, in a typical season, it wouldn't have mattered because the Montreal Canadiens finished the regular season 18th. Mm -hmm. uh, in a typical season, they wouldn't have made the postseason. It would have been all said and done, and they would have they would have been playing golf for weeks and weeks by now. Um, and so that was really uh, kind of you know when you look at that, it's as we said, the end of the regular season, they did not perform well. Um, that push for the playoffs wasn't wasn't there. They fell flat in that. Um, and just because of this different season with the divisional alignment and and the way things were things were done is the only reason the Canadians sne squeaked into the postseason uh, in any other year finishing 18th overall in the league. That would have happened. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it brings to mind that, you know, they did change coaches from Claude Julien to Dominique uh, Ducharme. And mm -hmm. he is uh, still has a couple days left uh, with a, a COVID uh, interruption. He has to sit out. And Luke Richardson, who is already getting a lot of praise for how he's handled the, the defensemen with uh, Montreal, has uh, stepped into the uh, the void and has been really receiving a lot of praise uh, for his work with the squad. And it almost recalls the Flyers when Roger Nielsen had to go out and Craig Ramsey took over and eventually took his job. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here. <laughs> but uh, is, is that something that maybe there are some whispers about? Because it, it seems like either way, Luke Richardson is reemerged as a head coaching candidate uh, somewhere in the very near future. Um, I, I agree with you there. Luke Richardson is putting on a tremendous display of uh, head coaching ability. Uh, Luke Richardson is steady. He's calm. He communicates very effectively. Uh, you see in his press conferences, he, he is thoughtful in his responses. He's knowledgeable in his responses. Um, he handles the media well. He's, he's well-spoken. Uh, and you can see that the players very much respect him. Um, you know, Luke Richardson had a, a pretty good uh, and pretty lengthy NHL playing career, of course, played for a number of years with the Flyers and, and made, uh, made the playoffs uh, for four of the five years that he played for the Flyers. Mm -hmm. um, he's got lots of postseason experience. He's got lots of NHL experience. Um, he's got great coaching experience. You know, he spent four years as the assistant coach of the Ottawa Senators before then getting a head coaching position in the AHL, play, uh, coaching for their at the time, Ottawa's AHL affiliate was in Binghamton. The Binghamton Senators uh, spent four years head coaching there, uh, uh, head coached uh, 
Team Canada for the Spengler Cup a number of years ago, and then got back to the NHL as an assistant coach with the New York Islanders. And now this is the third year as his assistant co- as an assistant coach with the Montreal Canadiens. He has got uh, a tremendously solid background in coaching experience. His players respect him um, in a in a season where defense has been mm, shaky at best, at least in the regular season for the Montreal Canadiens and not very deep per se. Uh, he's managed their decor very well and has slotted in very naturally uh, into the head coaching position. Is he going to be uh, the the next head coach of the Montreal Canadiens? I doubt it. Um, if there is one thing that Montreal does cater towards, they, they do tend to, I, I'm not saying this is 100% of the time, but they do uh, strive to typically have a coach who is bilingual in French and English. Um, Luke Richardson uh, is not. And Dominic Ducharme, despite the fact that uh, I, that's a whole conversation for a different day on, on how I believe Dominic Ducharme has done in, in having to be inserted into that interim uh, role. Um, while it's still a question as to whether or not Ducharme will have that interim tag removed, I think there will be a, a wider search uh, for whoever is going to be the permanent replacement for Claude Julian. But I do believe Luke Richardson is now opening some eyes around the league of, you know, this guy's doing a really exceptional job um, and uh, could certainly, I think, deservedly get some looks uh, with other organizations for sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, 1,400 plus games. And yeah. like you said, we uh, we had Luke here from like 98 to 2003 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, classic steady Eddie uh, defensive defenseman who adds uh, toughness and all that, and he's kind of brought that mentality uh, to his, you know, to behind the bench. And yeah, I, I look for him to be uh, someone people are going to be talking about in the off season. But you know, one thing, Amy, is uh, also, you know, we might not be here with the Montreal Canadiens had it not been for the contributions of a diminutive player that the Flyers had two cracks at a couple of years ago at the draft, Cole Caulfield. He's really, even in spite of some uneven moments that you would expect for such a young player, he's come up big and been involved and showed some real skill at at, at critical moments that uh, have helped the Canadians during these playoffs. He certainly has. Uh, It's been quite a year for Cole Caulfield, uh, finishing up his second season, his sophomore season at Wisconsin. uh, He at least had the opportunity to uh, to compete in the in the road to the frozen four uh, Wisconsin that was probably the one one big negative on on his uh, checklist this year is that Wisconsin was bounced pretty early from that tournament uh, in a big upset game Uh, but you know he's he's got the the uh, world juniors um, then of course a uh, tremendous record-breaking season for him in the NCAA, uh, then goes on to sign his ELC, uh, makes his pro debut with the Laval Rocket just uh, shortly over the course of, of, a, of a couple of days on the road in Toronto playing the Marlies, where he uh, you know, makes his pro debut just about an hour after it's announced that he is the winner of the Hobie Baker for this year. Uh, goes on into his pro debut that night to score his first pro goal. Uh, had a couple of points that night, had a couple of points the next day. Pretty tremendous opening weekend for him. Not long before he gets uh, called up to the Canadians, makes his uh, NHL debut, has has started to contribute there, and is now in a deep run uh, in the Stanley Cup playoffs. It has been quite a year for Cole Caulfield, uh, to be sure. Um, and Cole Caulfield is one of those natural hockey players where it just, everything seems to come easy for him. Um, And he has very good hockey IQ on how to play the game at any level. Um, There has been a bit of a learning curve upon getting to the NHL. Um, There are certainly things that uh, he still needs to work on. Um, and And he did, to his credit, once he realizes the things he needs to work on, he does that. Um, in his freshman campaign with Wisconsin, um, we actually traveled to Penn State uh, when Wisconsin was visiting uh, to play back-to-back games against Penn State. And so we went and, and scouted him for those two games uh, 
interviewed he and Tony and his head coach, Tony Granado, to talk about, you know, how things were going for the young forward in his freshman campaign. And, and Tony Granado said flat out, uh, you know, Cole Caulfield needs to, while he is an incredible scorer and an incredible uh, offensive forward, he very much needs to work on his defensive play, particularly in his own zone. And it was very apparent in his freshman campaign. Uh, fast forward to this past season, his sophomore season, and he absolutely uh, made improvements uh, in those areas. You can see that he tries to play a more defensive uh, style of game, but there are there's still work to be done there. Um, Last night against Tampa Bay, he looked a little lost. Um, sometimes his size does, while it does work to his advantage plenty of times, there's times it works to his disadvantage as well. And and uh, he was certainly getting muscled off the puck a lot last night by a very big, strong, physical Tampa Bay Lightning team. Look, Cole Caulfield is going to be uh, a, a big star in the NHL for, for years to come. You know, he's going to have some growing pains, uh, but he's he's certainly making a difference. He brings a lot of energy and a lot of smiles and a lot of laughs to the ice, to his teammates, to fans. Uh, he's he's already a fan favorite. And uh, it's it's been it's been quite a year for him and and for the, the Canadians bringing him in and, and for fans as well. We'll see what uh, what he eventually turns out to be. But it's uh, it's it's been a pretty exciting start for him, for sure. Yeah, I, I think from the Philadelphia perspective, obviously, the Flyers went and drafted Cam York and then used the trade down draft pick. What was it? Bobby Brink they went with. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be something fair or unfair. It's just the nature of fans. You know how that is um, to make a comparison and see how that works out. Because Caulfield has a skill set. The Flyers have really lacked in someone like Simone Gagne. So mm -hmm. that absolutely that's a little um, subplot there. <laughs> it is. And, you know, he was no one. The thing is, no one expected Caulfield to fall as far in the draft as he did. Um, Central scouting had him ranked eighth. Uh, and, uh, you know, sure enough, the Flyers came up at, at pick 14 and he was still available. Uh, and you're right. They picked they, they ended up going with Cam York. Montreal was uh, the 15th overall pick right after that. And they snapped up Cole Caulfield, never expecting that he would still be available. Um it's easy, and I certainly understand when you when you see constant highlight reels and headlines about Cole Caulfield. It's easy to get caught up in the why didn't the Flyers select him, um, and and that coulda woulda shoulda can go on forever if you want to. Um, it's fine for me. It's fine to be excited about Cole Caulfield. It's fine to to even kind of lament, oh, if only we had that kind of talent on the Flyers. Well, you take it, but at the same time. Um, with that, I, I feel we also have to appreciate what Cam York is going to bring. Um, we all know goaltending is the uh, probably the position that takes the longest amount of time to develop uh, in professional hockey. Defense is a very close second. Um, it's it takes a pretty incredible defenseman to make an immediate impact uh, in the league. And so Cam York is certainly not behind the eight ball in any way, shape or form. Uh, upon playing for the Phantoms this year, he did not look out of place. He looked very strong, in fact. Um, and I think that he's got a very bright future ahead of him. And frankly, the, the Flyers need uh, some fresh blood and some and some new uh, depth on the back end. So I. I don't think Cam York is a bad choice. Um, it's just a very different choice from choosing Cole Caulfield. Um, and you think about, I mean, Cole Caulfield with the year he had had, um, if he had come into the Flyers, it, say the Flyers had drafted him, and after the year he had uh, in the NCAA and with the World Juniors and whatnot and signed his ELC and came into the Flyers dressing room at the end of the regular season, would the Flyers season have ended any differently? Probably not. Um, no. And it probably would have been a, a very tough situation to bring a young rookie into. Um, not saying that that's an excuse, not saying that that's a reason to have not drafted him or anything like that, but it's it's just, they're very different situations, they're very different players, and I think that you can appreciate what both of them will bring to, to, to the NHL, um, and I think that Cam York has a bright future ahead of him, I think Flyers fans can get excited about, about him, and I think it's still 
while yes, I agree with you, uh, Caulfield would bring an element, as you say, that they haven't really had uh, in scoring up front uh, for quite a while. At the same time, they desperately need to start building that back end. Um, and I think Cam York is is one of the big pieces of the puzzle to do that going forward. Yeah, there's no question about that. So I was going to ask this question last, but it just seems more natural, Amy, to get on on the board with Bay. What was your pick before the um, Stanley Cup finals began? Just because people are going to want to know. My pick overall, uh, I, I, you know, as I've as I've gone through um Every round of this series, as I said, I, they were constantly the underdogs. I expected Toronto to 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 take care of them pretty quickly. Uh, after that, um, Winnipeg was well rested. They had swept Edmonton, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl. They were they they had been resting for nine days. Uh, they had better goaltending than Toronto with uh, Connor Hellebuck uh, in the crease. I expected. Uh, Winnipeg to be a roadblock for them uh, and then they ended up sweeping Winnipeg when they got to Vegas I thought well there's no there's no way there's no way they're going to get past the Vegas Golden Knights they're just too strong uh, their forecheck is too good um, flurry is a whole a whole different beast um, and it won't happen and they proved me wrong again <laughs> so I'm kind of really uh, not doing well with my predictions but I think Tampa Bay um, is possibly one hill too big for them to climb um, and I, th I think game two is going to tell it all if the Canadians play the same way in game two that they did in game one uh, I think it's going to be a short series um, Overall, I have Tampa Bay in six. I think the Canadians will manage to win a game, at least a game at home. Um, but I don't, I, I, I don't think that they're going to find a way to defeat the defending Stanley Cup champions. Yeah, I, I'm, I picked the same. I, I think the Canadians are going to uh, put a little bit of uh, fright into the uh, Tampa Bay fan base. But at the end of the day, I, I picked the Lightning in six uh, as well. So. Uh, it should be a good series. Uh, it's uh, it's two different approaches and two really good goaltenders. I can't fault Price on anything I saw last night. Not at all. <laughs> no. The, 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 the quality of chances that, that they are able to, to generate is really something else than the consistency with which they do that. It seems like the Islanders are really the only team that were able to shut some of that down. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I agree. Um, and the one thing that the Lightning were able to do uh, in the first game was drive the net, crash the crease, and get in close on Carey Price. And you saw that disrupted uh, that disrupted the Canadians' uh, defense uh, quite a bit. Uh, it caused a lot of trouble, a lot of physicality. Um, and on the flip side of that, the Canadians could not make clean zone entries. And if they did, they weren't getting deep. They were immediately turning the puck back over and, and it was back uh, back up ice. So, yeah, it's a tall task for them, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you see a player like Tyler Johnson come back making plays or breaking up plays in the defensive zone and, and, and outletting like a defenseman. You know, there's a lot of guys on Tampa that play that kind of game. And it's a, it's a daunting task, but it should be an exciting series. Looking forward to that. And, uh, hey, I just want to remind everybody before we continue that the OMB podcast is brought to you by uh, Jim's South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, four decades of the Philly cheesesteaks in the finest Philadelphia tradition. And listen, if you live down near 400 South Street and you can't get there, don't worry. They work with DoorDash and the delicious food can be brought right to your door. So remember, when it's time for the best cheesesteaks, Hoagie's Price, and all of that wonderful stuff, make sure you go to Jim South Street, 400 South Street in Philadelphia, PA. All right. Thanks for that, Amy. Um, You're making me hungry. I haven't uh, had a, I haven't had a, I haven't had a whiz wit from Jim's in, in, in quite a while. So I got, it's going to go on the calendar now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got definitely have to put, so anyway, I, I think as we turn towards the Flyers, if some pundits locally have taken what the Canadians have done, and concluded that the Flyers may not be so far away from cup contention if Chuck Fletcher 
has a really productive offseason, kind of like just getting the playoffs. Anything can happen. Montreal's proof of that. The 2010 Flyers are proof of that. I, I think it sells short the strategy of Bergevin's move, moves uh, because he had had a kind of dry run last year in the bubble. But uh, what, what's your feeling in that regard? You know, this is it, it's a it's an interesting question. It's a good question. Um, they always say, everyone says, if you if you can just make the postseason, anything is possible. Uh, the Habs are absolutely um, perfect illustration of that this year. Um, the St. Louis Blues were the perfect uh, example of that a couple of years ago. Um, so anyone, if you can make the postseason, things happen that don't happen in the regular season. Um as far as comparisons about, you know, if the Canadians can do it based off of what Bergevin has done this year, can Chuck Fletcher do that in one season of off se- of off season moves? Um, I-, I think it would take a lot of um, pieces coming together for him to be able to do that. I think he needs to have an exceptionally busy off season uh, to to, for my liking, he's he's been uh, a little too quiet the past two off seasons. Um, and it's not just about uh, drafting well. He's got to make moves, uh, whether it's trades and whether it's free agency signings this summer. Um, there needs to be, I think, some roster turnover. Um, and and Chuck Fletcher needs to have, I think he needs to get that good mix of putting the pieces in place to start building for the next couple of years. But also there are immediate needs that need to happen. Um if he can work his magic and and make a number of really big moves and bring in some really key pieces, um, the thing that's really going to, I think, determine of whether or not the, the Flyers can recover from this season and make a playoff push next year and, and make even make the postseason to have the chance to, to do whatever they're able to do. Um, it's going to be the chemistry of the guys in that locker room. When you look at the Canadians, as I said, in that first, uh, in that first round against Toronto, they were down three, one in that series. And I mean, it was pack it up, book the tea times. They looked terrible in the first half of that yeah. series. Um, Mark Bergevin's pieces were all there. They were all in that locker room. They looked terrible to start that season. It wasn't until the leadership in that dressing room, Shea Weber, Carey Price particularly, but they were joined by Eric Stahl and Corey Perry, had a meeting with that locker room once they were down 3-1 and had a very, very big, long heart-to-heart about, we are running out of opportunities to do this for, for guys at our level of our career. Um, you know, Shea Weber and Carey Price both don't have a Stanley Cup yet. Um, and it was stop listening to the noise outside this dressing room. We know that we can do it. We all have to buy in. We all have to do this for each other. And whatever was said by that leadership core of veterans who are trying to perhaps maybe their last opportunity at a cup, whatever was said there, the team bought into that. And from that point on, as soon as they won that, that game five, it's been no looking back ever since then. So yes, the pieces can be there. And like I said, Mark Bergevin's pieces were there, but they were, they were this close to, to getting bounced pretty early from the playoffs. It wasn't until, you know, it's that team in that dressing room has to come together and decide for each other we are going to do this 100% together and put it all out, egos aside, personal goals aside, we have to do this together. And I think that's a big key. If Chuck Fletcher can put the right pieces into place in the offseason and all of those guys come to the table with the same goal in mind and not personal agendas and so forth, then yes, they could certainly, anything's possible um, and they could certainly make something happen. Yeah, I mean, my my concern with, with comparing the two scenarios is that the Canadians played a style that is more uh, workable, practicable for a playoff run. And the Flyers don't have a lot of those kind of players. They also don't have the type of leadership group 
even if they haven't won cups, they really haven't been perennial all-stars. There's not a lot of players that can build on success and get up in front of a group and say, hey, you know, automatic respect outside, not just the locker room, but in the whole league. The Flyers, I just think there's a lot of elements there that are mm-hmm. needed to be inserted by Chuck Fletcher before you start comparing those two scenarios. You know, mm-hmm. you, Carter Hart is not Carey Price, and our best defenseman, if it's Ivan Provorov, is not Shea Weber. So they have to ascend to that level before we even have that conversation. Absolutely, and there are those are two of the big things that Chuck Fletcher needs to to make happen this summer. Uh, he absolutely needs to shore up the defense. Uh, you know, he he is even he and Av, you know, are the first to admit that uh, Niskanen left a bigger hole than they expected, um, and that the pieces that they put into place did not fill that hole. Um, they so defense is absolutely something that needs to be a focal point in the off season, and finding a younger but experienced backup goaltender for Carter Hart is also another big piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, Moose did a did a, a very commendable job this year, but you could see towards the end of the season whether it was you know Carter needing to take some time off to to kind of settle down and and refocus, or it was then him dealing with an injury. Uh, you know, when Elliot got ridden too much uh his age showed he got tired he got sloppy um and it was just too much for him uh so you need an experienced guy to back up carter hart to be there as a guide and as a mentor and and that is someone solid you can rely on but who also you know knock on wood if if he needed to be put in more than typical that he's not going to to wear out too easily either so i think those are two two of the bigger pieces that Chuck Fletcher really needs to figure out this summer. Yeah. Well, you're touching on some of the main tangible needs, you know, the, the defense and, and, and getting it back up goaltenders. Uh, what, what are some of the other ones? If you have your druthers that are maybe in that category and maybe some intangibles with uh, addressing some of the off ice or cultural things in the room that I think have come to the fore over the last three or four years. Um, you know, as far as tangible things, they'd certainly also need to find some firepower up front. Uh, as you mentioned, when we were talking about Cole Caulfield, uh, the, the, this, the offensive production by the big guns up front has fallen off. Um, you look at Giroux, you look at Voracek, um, you know, Couturier, I think is, is one guy that you can continue to build from, uh, you know, he's, he's, you saw this past season when he was out even for just a little bit of time, um, how much the flyers struggled and how much it, they were helped upon his return. So Couturier is one of the, one of the guys of the, of the veteran core in the forwards that you can really rely on, but you need some firepower up front. Um, going along with that, you know, our, yes, um, you know, Giroux and Voracek, these kinds of guys provide their, their, your leadership core. Um, are they still effective at that in the dressing room? Are they still effective with their on ice production? Um, is it time to shake things up a little bit and, and start to make some open roads for some of the younger guys coming up uh, who are ready to step in? Um, do you make a move for, for a different kind of power forward? Um those are the big questions that you really have to ask. Uh, you also need to figure out what's going on with Nolan Patrick. Um, you know, there's plenty of rumors circulating that Nolan Patrick isn't happy. Uh, what is the reason for that? Is is it that he's young and still going through his own growing pains and coming off of, of this uh, unfortunate injury that he's been plagued with that that caused him to miss an entire season? And is is he just lacking confidence or is it, uh, you know, dissent in the locker room? Is it uh, not good communication with the coaching staff? Is what, what is, what is the, the genesis of what's going on with Nolan Patrick? Because when you look at his return compared to Oscar Lindblom's return this year, it was like night and day. Um, Nolan Patrick struggled this year. Um, is it residual effects of his injuries? We don't know. Is it um, off ice issues? We don't know. Is it, is it, you know, like I said, coaching, locker room, we don't know. I think that's a, a key piece uh, of figuring out what Nolan Patrick needs, what he's going to be able to give you going forward. I mean, he's a first-round pick. It's not something you um, 
it's not it's not a piece of your of your asset core that you just kind of toss aside. Um, I think all avenues have to be explored before before you think about moving him, um, and try to get the try to get out of him what he has the potential to give. Yeah, I, I, that's a, a player they have to even either move on from or try to get a monster off season going into this year because I, I think. When when you look at what the Flyers have done over the last two out of the th- three years, and there's a question about their compete level. You want guys that are bought in here, and if they're not, even if you had to take a loss, in I guess in a tangible sense, maybe the idea that everybody in that room that you're looking around, if you're on the if you're one of the players. This guy's got my back. That guy's got my back. I'm not sure about that guy. And I don't think the Flyers are in a position that they can continue along that track any further. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, you know, there were there were times this season in post-game pressers that there were, I think it was Shane Goss despair even, that, that uh, you know, there were, there were some comments made that made it sound like, um... Is there complete confidence of everyone else in that locker room? Um, and that's not something that you want to hear, particularly in a in a public facing press conference. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about how the Canadians have pulled together in this postseason. The guys in a dressing room have to work together as a unit. They have to believe in each other. They have to be able to trust each other. Um, and and as you say, if if they don't have that, uh, it's going to be an uphill battle the whole way. Uh, so is it, is it, can the the big question I think is going to be, can they get back to a team that's fighting together as a unit with, uh, the, the veteran core and the leadership core that they currently have, that's going to be, I think the big question, because if that leadership core can't pull, uh, the Flyers dressing room together, um, it's going to be, it's going to be a really, really difficult challenge to to put together any sort of any sort of uh, a season that's going to come out with a winning record. Yeah, agreed. And especially when you add in that Claude Giroux and Sean Couturier are on the final year of their deal. There's mm-hmm. discussion about acquiring a player like Seth Jones, who is also in a similar situation. Amy, I would think that. Given that the Flyers, if they would make a deal for a player who's got a year left, who's going to be a UFA, they definitely want to have a strong indication and actually a name on a contract before they would uh, complete that transaction or else they would have a a possibility of a mini calamity there and a complete turnover. For sure. Um, You know, and it's Elliot Friedman, even in his 31 thoughts this week, says that uh, the Flyers are still are still in on trying to make a deal with Seth, uh, for Seth Jones happen. Um, we even on, on, uh, the podcast that we have at rockets, one of the podcasts we have at rocket sports, uh, my, my colleague, Rick Stevens, and I even talked about this uh, a week or so ago, you know, talking about, um, you know, is, is a Matt Dumba the, the right approach, um, or, um, is a, a soda strum, the right, the right, the right course to go. There's, there's a lot of pieces that you could put into place, but you're right. You have to know that those pieces are going to be there before you're trading away pretty big assets. And I mean, when you're talking about Drew, you're talking about a guy who's been the captain of the flyers for a very long time. He's, he's uh, fans in the city mostly love him. There's, I think, I think they have a bit of a love hate relationship, uh, but, but uh, you know, he is the, f- he's a big face of the Philadelphia Flyers. So you're not going to, you're not going to part with him if you don't know that you've got uh, things kind of in the bag and up your sleeve that are going to help replace that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know it has been stated and Claude Giroux has said it his, it his intention is to retire as a flyer, but if, Sean Couturier has waited a decade to win, and it doesn't look like that's going to happen here, and he wants to fly the coop. That could alter things. Things have a way of changing very quickly in the National Hockey League. Absolutely. Um, And we have seen in the past that the Flyers are, as an organization, are not uh, certainly not afraid to pull the trigger on getting rid of uh, 
making offseason moves with their with their current leadership core. You remember the summer that Jeff Carter and Mike Richards both uh, both <laughs> were ushered out. Um, you know, it was it came as a surprise to some people. Some, of course, again, there was a, you know there was some, certainly some love hate in the city uh, with those two as well. But um, you know. In the offseason, particularly coming off of a season like the Philadelphia Flyers just had this past year, I would say anything's possible. Yeah, I think a lot of people are they, – they feel like the ownership at, at that time is different from what the people are now. We're almost mm-hmm. hoping that that spirit will, can be revived so that bold moves can happen, not just for the sake of it. We've gone on long enough, and, and as Chuck Fletcher himself said – We've been building this thing since 2014, and that's an eternity in, in, in professional sports. So we'll have to see how that works out. For sure. <laughs> yeah. So you shouldn't be bashful. You, you had your Press Zone podcast, and you had some clips with Oscar Lindblom, who won the Masterton uh, Trophy. And that's a big deal. I mean, he's nominated twice. I thought last year it wasn't quite there because he hadn't come back the way you would want. But this year, he's a deserving winner, The especially when you look at the Ewing sarcoma and the survival rates and the fact that he, he showed flashes of being that player he was before he went out. You know, Oscar Lindblom is, um, I, I think, journalism aside, objectivity aside, there's not a story currently that that tugs at the heartstrings more than Oscar Lindblom. Um, we all know what it felt like when uh, his diagnosis was announced uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and and for sure, as you say, with, with the survival rates for Ewing sarcoma and knowing the battle that he had ahead of him um, at that, you know, there was a long time that we were all just praying for, uh, for good health for him. Uh, you know that he had to have faced the possibility that he might not skate again, that he might not play pro hockey again. Um, And the story that he has had from um, ringing the bell, finishing treatment, continuing to be strong, coming back into the bubble in the playoffs last season and taking the ice again was, was a remarkable uh, accomplishment for him. And then to come into this season, play, the full shortened season. And, and yes, um, you know, we talked about Nolan Patrick a few minutes ago and that Oscar Lindblom was the complete opposite. Lindblom, while he admittedly had, had times during the season where his conditioning, he felt still wasn't up to quite par and he would get tired uh, and fatigued, uh, particularly with how compacted the schedule was. Um, He was out there looking like the Oscar Lindblom before his diagnosis. Um, and that Oscar Lindblom is a very skilled player. Uh, he has a lot of upside to him. I think he has a lot of potential for growth growing forward. And I think he's going to be a big piece for the Philadelphia Flyers moving forward. Um, you know, his, his press conference, uh, upon winning the Masterton was typical Oscar Lindblom. Uh, ever since the first time we interviewed him way back, uh, in, shortly after he was drafted, he has always been a quiet, humble, and modest young man. Um, and that has not changed for him. Uh, one bit, he was very humble in, in his press conference after winning the Masterton and talked about how his, his goal this off season is that he just wants to get stronger and get back to, as he put it, he wants to get back to being the player he was before he got sick or even better. Um, and that, that kind of determination is very encouraging to hear from Oscar Lindblom. I, I agree. He he thoroughly deserved this award this year. Um, and I think that a lot of his strength, as he said in that press conference, comes from uh, the unending support of his teammates, whom he calls his second family in the United States, and knowing that he has the full support of the entire city of Philadelphia and the Flyers fan base behind him, I think are the things that really keep him going. Yeah, absolutely. He's, uh, he's a joy to watch, uh, as a, a guy that you want to root for. Uh, like you said, he's a pretty quiet, humble, but he's an amiable uh, guy off the ice and everybody loves the guy. We're all written for him. So we got our fingers crossed. Hopefully Oscar can re- return to form. So Amy, one thing else that happened of note, this past week 
you know, Flyers will never forgive Dave Haxtell for the low to high offense, the poorly timed challenges and mm. uh, scratching Oscar for Yuri Laterra. But what's your sense of the league wide reaction to his hiring uh, by the Seattle Kraken to be their first head coach? Uh, surprise shock. Um, I think there were, I, I think uh, a lot of people thought Rick Tockett had that in, in, in the bag. Um, certainly Flyers fans. I, I had to chuckle just watching my timeline on, on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Flyers Twitter uh, was full of hot takes for Seattle upon that announcement. Most of which were, yeah, good luck with that. Um, it's uh, I didn't see that one coming for sure. Um you know, Dave Haxtell did uh, not have a great, uh, great experience uh, in Philadelphia. Um, you know, and it's it's an interesting choice for them. I mean, Dave Haxtell, his playing career uh, was not long, and most of it was in the NCAA and the IHL. Uh, he doesn't have any AHL or NHL playing experience. Um and then the bulk of his coaching experience was in the NCAA. I mean, he spent um, 15 years coaching at UND, the University of North Dakota. Uh, 11 of those years, he was serving as head coach and a couple of years as as associate head coach. Um, to make, and, and I think, you know, back in, in the 2015-16 season when, the head coach position opened for the Flyers and they went with Haxtell. I think at that point we all kind of sat up and said, really uh, a head coach. And it's, it's, it's not that common for a head coach from the NCAA to make the jump to head coaching in the NHL. Um, and so it, I think raised some eyebrows at the time and uh, the experiment did not go well. Uh, of course we know when it, when he was fired, they went 12 and 15 to, to start that season. It wasn't a good year in, in 2018, 19. Um, and so now he's gone and he spent a couple of years, uh, as assistant coach for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And it's funny to me because it, it seems like all of the media and all of the, the positive press around him being named as the new head coach for the Seattle Kraken, all focuses on, well, you know, he's done a great job as the assistant coach in Toronto uh, for the last couple of years. And, and sure, that's the case. I'm sure, you know, Sheldon Keefe is a, is a very, very effective head coach. I'm sure he's learned a, a lot from him, as is Kyle Dubas, a, a terrific general manager. Um, but it's, it's funny that all of the coverage seems to ignore the fact that he also had NHL head coaching time before that that didn't turn out so well. Um, so, you don't say, you don't say, yeah, <laughs> you don't say. it's funny. <laughs> it's funny that that doesn't seem to make any of the headlines when it's, oh, well, Toronto Maple Leafs assistant coach, uh, Dave Haxtell has been, well, yes, that's his most recent position, uh, that has been okay. You could call it successful. He's done a, he's done a, a decent job, uh, there. Um, and they seem to ignore the fact that, that he was the head coach for the Philadelphia Flyers and that didn't go so well. Um, I will be curious to see how this pans out for the Seattle Kraken. Um, I, I think they may have been better served to go with someone who not only has more, um, I'm not even as concerned about the, the playing experience themselves, but to really understand the game, I feel that, you know, there needs to be solid amounts of, of coaching experience at the pro level, whether that's spending time. We just talked about it with Luke Richardson. You know, he was the head coach of an AHL franchise for four years right. um, and, and has, spe has spent a lot of time for a couple of different organizations, a few different organizations as an assistant coach. And I think I, you know, there is a, a progression there. And the, the reason is, is because you, there's a lot to learn. Um, so kind of Dave Haxtell's kind of jumping right back into the fire, going back to an, a head coaching position for a brand new franchise. Um, who knows? He's sporting a brand new goatee. So maybe, maybe it's a new Dave Haxtell who, uh, who's going to debut behind the bench uh, for the crack. And I, I wish him, I wish him well. I, I hope he's successful, but I, I'm kind of hedging my bets right now. We'll, we'll, we will see how how this works out, and particularly um, how he handles uh, the younger players on the Krakens team and and the prospects. Um, as you say, you know, sometimes uh, healthy scratch choices are are a question mark with with Haxtell, and uh, we'll see how he handles that going forward. Yeah, I believe when you when they didn't talk about 
his uh, experience in Philadelphia. I believe they call that a tell. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of tells, does it give you also the same kind of um, input or insight, I sh should say, to what Ron Francis is thinking? Is he going to be less ambitious out of the gate than Vegas as a result of a, a choice like this? Does that tell you anything? Um, you know, Vegas, uh, as you said, Vegas came out of the gate swinging. Um, they were like shot out of a cannon and, and they, they put a stamp on the league right from the get go. Um, Ron Francis might be doing something a, a little more moderate. Um, but I think that he's also, I think he's aware that Seattle's emergence into the league is going to naturally be, be compared to Vegas's because they are the next expansion team. Um, and he certainly isn't going to want to have too many comparisons of, oh, well, Vegas did accomplish this and this and this in their first year, and then Vegas accomplished this and this and this in their second year. Um, he, he's not going to want too many disparaging comparisons. So I don't know that he's going to play it... Um, safe the whole way um but i think that uh i think that he's he's got more of a long-term build perhaps in mind um but i look to i look for him to try to be pretty effective right out of the gate as well yep and I, I, there's a lot of flyer fans out there thinking you know jvr or jake would really help seattle in their quest to uh, make that best first impression, but we'll have to see how that works mm -hmm. out. <laughs> well, and that's going to be the first when you when you talk about tells. That's going to be the next tell is is the moves that they make in the expansion draft um, and the moves that they make leading up to it. Uh, it's it's that will give I think all of us a, a pretty good indication on on how on how Francis is going to play his cards. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, Amy, I think we're going to wrap it right there. Thank you so much for, for coming on. What can you tell people about your uh, where to find you, your social media coordinates and some activities you have coming up? <laughs> well, I appreciate, uh, I, I again, I appreciate the invitation. It's always fun to come on to talk to you um, and uh, certainly, certainly enjoyed this conversation. You can find me on Twitter at Flyers Rule, uh, but you can more importantly uh, follow our AHL report coverage of both uh, the Lehigh Valley Phantoms and uh, the Laval Rocket for the AHL. You can find that at the AHL Report on Twitter. We also have a Flyers dedicated uh, Twitter account, which is at the Flyers Report. And if you're interested in following anything about the Canadians right now through the Stanley Cup final, I highly recommend that you head over to allhabs.net. That's our Montreal Canadiens coverage. You can follow at allhabs on Twitter. Uh, we've got... Uh, been covering the Canadians for for more than uh, more than a decade, and so far this uh, this playoff season, we've engaged with over a million uh, Canadians fans from around the world, both on on Twitter and Facebook. So we invite you to join the conversation, and uh, certainly uh, we have um, every week on our Press Zone Philadelphia podcast, we have a all summer long, all off season long, we're talking Flyers all summer long. So be sure to tune in. <laughs> That's terrific. And uh, you can follow me, Isaiah, I-S-A-I-A-H, underscore 520. Isaiah, don't forget the underscore 520. But you definitely want to follow the OMB Podcast on Twitter, at OMB Puck, at OMB Puck. You ha we have a Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel. You can follow us on one of 12 uh, different uh, podcast platforms. If, if you could subscribe, follow, whatever's appropriate. Hit that notification bell on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it. And it moves us up the charts when people are looking for a Philadelphia Flyer podcast. So uh, please do that. So until next time, uh, I think we're going to have the usual gang of idiots back, the, the, the usual crew back right around uh, after the 4th of July. Until then, take care, everybody. 